and up, good. Bit of weight in your front leg, depending on how, how strong you are. And back down, control it back down. Most of your weight in one, one leg. Keep your foot touching just for pressure, just for pressure. Go up again, forward. It's a really good one to identify. Keep that foot in contact. If it's too hard, put the other foot in contact anyway. And back down. Good. Keep that foot in contact with the floor the whole time. And then swap sides. All we're looking at is an obvious difference between sides and where your body goes and where your knee goes and those type of things to identify where a weakness might be. So does anyone feel an obvious weakness from one side or the other? If you've had surgery, like of course. reconstruction, should yeah. you eventually get back to normal? You, you wouldn't train yourself to get back to that. But it's probably not going to bother you unless you're doing lots of training. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, so I would modify it, and I'd put you into a position where you're putting, you know, seventy-five percent there and twenty-five percent there. So you still, you still can do it, and you can use it as a training program. But you're just trying to identify quick things to identify: um, is there an issue from one side or the other in regards to strength and control around the hip and pelvis? Because this is testing quads and glutes. Okay, this test, and it's a functional movement for running, standing on one leg. Okay, and the, the last two tests, um, we'll get everyone to the second one, but if you're on to your back over, oh, actually John, do you mind going onto the floor? Yeah. <laughs> onto your back, this way. The bridge test for hamstring endurance, okay. Knees bent at, nine, at sort of 45 degrees, okay. Bum up off the bed, off the chair, off the floor, and down. Okay, so we will get that on a metronome, so it's one every two seconds, up on one, down on one, so it's reliable. But to measure endurance from left versus right, we'll take this leg off the floor. John's going to now come up, all the way up, extend, and down on two seconds, and we'll do the download of the metronome on the apps, which everyone has an iPhone these days, and you can do that to time, okay? I won't torture everyone else this with this today, because you'll walk out with hamstring pain, <laughs> um, but that is a good measure. Over 30 is a measure we use at the footy club. Okay, you might find different variations in the athletes. Yeah, kids need to get to be able to get the 15 to 20 at least, the younger kids, okay, of, of doing this task. Not before that, yeah, well, they're weak in the hamstrings. If you're overloading the hamstrings with running and they've got no endurance or strength in there, they'll most likely at some stage injure a hamstring if they get their training loads up. Okay, so simple task there. Thanks, and the last strength task we can look at is, um, you see heel raise, so everyone's standing up for us, okay, and we'll go for, through the heel raise test, unless anyone's got a calf strain or a bad Achilles, okay. So, we're on one leg, up, down, up, down, and that time, okay. So I want everyone going on their left for, let's go for about 30 reps, because that's the measure we try and get to, up. Down, I mean, that's just for balance, but purely all you're trying to do is see can they get to a, a normal level of ideally 25. Some good research saying that you're higher risk of injury in your calf and your shin if you have poor calf endurance. Some good studies on that. And so we definitely need calf endurance up to 25, okay? And if they can't do it straight away, don't break them, train them, put this into their training program, which we'll put at the end with some info, okay? So I won't torture you to do it all on both sides, but you just get an idea from what's happening there. Thanks, so John. I'll indicate. <laughs> Thanks, Vinny. Thanks, you're, you're mate. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll indicate, they'll, they'll say, oh, I can't do any more, it's too slow. Yeah, and the technique, you've got to keep, keep it consistent. So if they're doing this and not getting all out, that's, that's boom, done, you've got six, or whatever it might be, you know? So that's good. So. The functional testing now, I think, is the week. I'll, I'll whip through this because we've only limited time today and I want to sort of identify a few other things. But um, your standing posture, if we stand like that in a sway posture, we switch off here, we switch off here. Standing like that, correcting that, switches muscles on. Okay, so that's important to know. Um, we don't get the glutes working when we sway stand. Uh, body types, we look at sort of rigid. This is one of our ex-footy players here on the bottom, just muscle bound, can't let go of his abs. Um, he's sort of high tone, I've got that around the wrong way there clearly. The top guy's a low tone, floppier, floppier guy, and he hangs and he sits, stands without tension, and he's at risk of, of pain because of things. The higher tone guy, too rigid, can't move, he's also at risk. So we sort of want to be able to move but also not flop. 
Does that make sense? And, and everyone has different body types. So you're going to have different athletes with different attributes. They need to be managed in different ways. Um, this dissociation movement, can everyone hop up again, please? This is a nice one to practice. <laughs> okay, kid, just normal movement. Can you do the salsa? Okay, and yeah, good. It's, hu it's humorous watching some people do it. Can you dissociate your pelvis doing this way? Okay, if you can't do these simple tasks again, there are ideas in my head that, okay, athlete sort of mo motor awareness is poor. That's good, I think everyone's pretty good at that. What's a couple of the guys from my, um, my footy club? Okay, so again, pretty rigid, but now the next one. <laughs> so you can see he has no concept of how to do that. So because he's too rigid, and, and it's quite humorous now whether he's just a, a what we call a motor moron where he doesn't he doesn't know how to work his motor system. He, he's not the cleverest bloke either, but um, at the same time he still should be able to move his um, his hips and pelvis. So, so when you sorry to interrupt, yeah. when you identify that, yeah. Um, individuals yeah. get individuals. Yeah. So he would need to do some loosening up around his trunk. He would need to stretch more, and then I would give him some floppy movement stuff, or on his back lengthening out. And their tasks again, if you identify them, you can then go and source someone that you're, you're comfortable with, a physio or a trainer that you might be working with, or whatever profession you'd like to work with, the physios I'm advising for, um, with, okay, how can I help this guy? I've identified this, what can you do, do to help me? And then we do that a lot, and then you send them to us, we send them back going, okay, do these things, okay, and work on that as a part of your program. So we've done squatting, you've looked at that, maintaining low doses is important. Um, a good squat versus a bad squat, so this is one of our rowers from many years ago, the rowing, squatting, you're trying to reach forward through your trunk, not being up too upright, which puts too much load on your knees. Um, so I would say it's a pretty good squat technique. Okay, young fella here, so he can't get deep with it. Does everyone see that? So he's a bit uncoordinated with it. He doesn't have good ankle movement for starters, and he doesn't have great body awareness. So. Another one, the one-legged squat, this is really important to look at. So the angle that's created here changes that kneecap alignment I was talking about, but also alignment through your Achilles, through your hip, um, through the whole lower limb. And we don't know why at times it breaks down in one particular point. Because we'll see, do that test with everyone. And sometimes people will break down the kneecap and get pain here, or sometimes they'll get glute pain because they angle their glute differently. But why exactly it's... The, weak, we, it, the body finds its weakest link, I guess, and that's what we're sort of figuring out. Looking, Chris, if, yeah. if you've got an athlete who can't do that movement. Exactly. You need to identify and then go through the training program. And I suppose today's about identifying it, and then you need to go, okay, how do I change that? And there's strategies of sit to stand, of different specific exercises to a target, changing that. doesn't mean you shouldn't run them, because actually when you run, you don't actually, it's not as hard as that. When you're running, your momentum's working, you can actually still look like you run pretty well. But theoretically, there's, a, there's an issue with endurance um, in your glutes with that. Um, if, in fact, you can't move well and you'll break down at some stage. Um, another one to Trent Allenberg is the obvious drop when you actually squat. Um, it's not coming up there, is it? So a single leg squat where you drop your pelvis as opposed to dropping your whole knee in. We call that trendella burst, a weakness in your butt or glute. Uh, and this is a younger kid with a poor trunk control more so. Can you see he shift his trunk across? So that's a different area, it's more trunk strengthening. So it's just sort of understanding how movement occurs and where you identify the weaknesses. And then, see his knee's pretty straight. So identifying what part of the actual area is issue. And again, a, a pretty strong athlete here, moving up and down, pretty straight across the pe pelvis line there, pretty straight up and down the knee. On the left one, it's very subtle, but what he does is overhitch a bit. So he keeps his right side up higher. It's very subtle, it's almost a reverse, so he's actually, he's actually not shock absorbing well with that one. But it's, it's all in the context of what their problem is too. Okay, looking at the feet, this poor person who walks like an ostrich um, has their ankles angling in. Okay, so pronation, massive effect in the athlete. So if you see someone who's 
doing that, look their feet as well. If they're collapsing in too much, they may need orthotic support or good footwear support, okay, or some advice um, to not go barefoot ever, please, because you'll break yourself. Um, not everyone needs orthotics, okay? Um, and just because they're pronating, good shoes can do that, okay? And, and targeting where to send them, someone for good shoes, you can develop that relationship through sports stores, through podiatrists, through, through physios who are able to give advice. But I like to refer to the people who, that's their area. Like if, if it's footwear, a podiatrist is probably really your, your first port of call to discuss. If, if the kids can't then you know, afford certain things, then you know, just talk to um, you know, someone who's in the area who knows a bit more about that. Uh, the running assessment, this is your, this is your thing. We, I won't go through running technical advice at the moment, um, but we, we need to video their running at times to actually help them identify with the whole, um, even if it's the iPhone, the iPad these days, to replay it back to them so they can identify, oh yeah, I'm not bringing my knee up, or I'm leaning to side, or I'm leaning too far forward. Those aspects are important. So treatment of the knee pain, again, it's probably not the forum today to go through treatment of everything, but identifying is important, but for knee pain being a common one, massaging down the side of the leg with the ITB roller, has anyone heard of that? Uh, or self-massage before you run. Um, get the flexibility up in your hamstrings or your calves with a stretching routine. Getting the bum strong with a series of exercises. Um, you know, orthotics or good footwear, these are the common things I've got up here. And then modifying train loads is probably the big one that, that you guys can probably do. Um, as a part of identifying it first. So low back pain um, is also common in your younger athlete because of posture number one, I reckon. Posture and strength control. If someone's weak around here, do a single leg squat and they're moving like they're moving, they're gonna stress their tissue in their back. If I'm moving my spine all the time, when I'm running, every time it's dropping or rotating, the joints in my spine will get irritated. If I do that to my finger 100 times right now, I'm gonna sensitize tissue it's no different to your back moving, you know, five, six hundred times every time you take a step. It doesn't happen straight away, but if I keep doing that, it's going to get a little bit sore. It sensitises tissue, and then that sensitivity in tissue creates all sorts of trigger points and tightness in different areas. And, you know, sometimes that's why we see a whole spectrum of pains coming from one area spreading out. Um, so, I suppose the arching one is a big one to look for for you guys. And you already know now what you're going to do if you get someone who's overarching the back. What, what do you look for? Hip flexor length. So that's one thing to look for. It's not the only thing. And also look for, can they actually tuck under? Can they actually do that? If they can't, then they might need to learn that. Do they need to stretch their back to bend forward while they're running? I've got a lot of our footy guys, they've got to run. They still have to run. They get a bit sore on their back. I don't stop them running. But after they've ran, I'll get them to hang forward so they're over, they're, they're going the other way. It's a bit like us if we're doing gardening. You're doing gardening for four hours, not that I ever do that, but um, you know, some people do. And you get up and you go back the other way. So it's just changing the position of your spine on, for what sort of stress you're putting through it. Posture is really important. Adjusting that, adjusting the kid's posture to get your muscles switching on. It does predict the way we sort of land as well, sitting posture, it's interesting. There's some sway postures. Sitting slumped, sway posture switches your muscles on. We know it through studies. EMG studies will show us muscle activity disappears and switches on when you're upright. Okay, so they're all important factors. I won't go through that. So look, probably the last 10 minutes is, is spent probably in injury prevention. How do, we, how do we prevent injury? Hopefully I've identified a few of the physical requirements there. Of, of just normal activity. So with trunk control, glute control, some endurance in your, in your important leg muscles, so your calf, hammy and quads. They're important things to look at. Um, I suppose biomechanical issues are, you know, running technique combined with your functional testing we did. All right? So identifying where their weaknesses are. And there's lots of, um, I suppose, systems out there. And the, the, the gray, is gray cook, did you say? Yeah, yeah is, a, is, a, is a recipe system. There's um, some other good um, uh, ideas that package it really well. But at the end of the day, it's, also, it's really a, a combination of good tests that are related to your sport that then you can use regularly and identify um, you know, how it relates to your athlete. Okay, so uh, it's, it's sort of just knowing all the tests and then putting it into place and picking the best ones. Because a lot of the recipes add things that 
Yeah, maybe that's not so relevant, um, but there's still good ways to identify. And it depends on how time consuming it is and how easy it is to put into your program. That's the other key thing, is, um, is, is structuring it properly, getting the process right. If you don't get the process right in putting these things into place, um, by identifying it in the first place, no point. And there's no point screening either if you're not going to do anything about it. That's the other key thing. You screen someone and we identify these things and we know it can reduce injury rate. Um, but if they don't do anything, it's not followed up on, don't waste your hour doing the screen uh, in, in some views. Uh, you're better off teaching them strength. And I try and teach kids on the first session while I'm going through it a bit about how you'd change right there and then rather than wait because they might not follow it up. So injury prevention, the biggest thing we found at the Eagles, um, stuff that we're working with is um, GPS data comes back all, every day on every play, every training session. We're, we're lucky we've got the resources to have sports science there and we've, you know, leaders in the field of the AFL in collecting data and then relating that to injury. And training load, unfortunately, <laughs> for coaches is probably one of the biggest things that causes injury. But also training load causes good performance. If you don't train someone hard, they don't get good but you need to modify it when it's identified as it's too high, okay? But any change in train load too quickly is a big issue. Any change in anything. So these are things that might change, okay? So these are levels, these are predictors. All these things up on here, and as I said, I can send it through to you. Um, the predictors on, on how um, your athlete might be at risk. So if all of a sudden, I haven't done any running at all and I've decided to go for a 10k jog, which I sometimes do, because you know, in your brain you still can exercise, I'm going to get sore. <laughs> I'm going to get sore. If I haven't ran for two weeks and I go out and think, oh, I've got half an hour now, I'll go for a run. Um, you're going to get sore. You can't have your athletes be sick for a week and then bring them back into the same training they did. You just can't do it because they'll, they'll, at some stage they'll break down or they'll push themselves. The kids don't self-manage well at all. You know, I've seen enough of them to know they come through, oh yeah, I was tight for a week, I didn't tell coach, but you know, it was tight. So we need to identify that earlier somehow through a, a process. Um, but these are all things for predictors for you. And look, everyone has a threshold, that's my threshold picture on braking. Um, so his ear snaps off in a minute. <laughs> but the, uh, the things that we're trying to identify are what is your, your athlete's threshold. And the kid who moves like this, is going to have a much lower threshold of activity until they break on how much training load they do. So what, we, what I really encourage you guys to do if you're not doing it is, and I'm, I know a lot of you are, is probably your training diary. Get your kids, and the pole vaulters do it really well. Um, the footy guys probably don't do it, but they, we've got people chasing them to do it. So we know exactly how much, how much they're doing. Um, it's, it's almost to the point of, it's a bit, um, uh, it's almost a little bit too, too much information coming from them, but it's, it's the best way to, to, to research and to identify what's um, causing injury. So collect a train diary, get them to write down Monday to Sunday what they do, not just what they do, how much time they spent doing it, their rating of perceived exertion, how hard it was in their view, how many minutes they spent doing it. Um, you know, you're not going to have GPS data to support that, but also measure how sore they were after the session or uh, maybe what mood they're in, you know, happy, sad, you know, medium. You know, you can come up with different, um, there's plenty of apps out there as well that exist for monitoring. But again, it comes back down to time and, and I suppose, are your kids going to buy into this or not? Is it important enough? But you know, you might not learn anything from it until a year of collecting all your data and then realise, look, this, this young guy can't actually tolerate this amount of training. And, and it's fine, I didn't know that until now I know it because I've seen how much he's done all year in the diary. And so, yeah, it's, I suppose it's a, put the onus on the kids to do it because good athletes, they'll do it and, you know, just put it in the spread and email you and you don't want to create too much more work for yourself being volunteer coaches though. Um, it, but again, it depends on how far you want to take it from a, from a coaching point of view. And we've gone over some simple screen tests for you there. Um, some sleep quality is really important, a very big predictor. So getting some rest is a really big, important part of becoming a good athlete, helping performance. Um, you know, act on existing pain. And that's probably a, a big one for us. How do we act on, how do you identify pain? Ask the kids occasionally, how are you going? I, I, you know, and maybe, is there any soreness anywhere today? And, and again, 
You don't want to ask the kids that are hypochondriacs either. <laughs> so you pick that out because <laughs> you'll never get them training. <laughs> There's a degree, and it's a balancing act. You know that. Um, and, and as coaches, you suppose you need to identify what, what kids are overdoing or over-reporting and what kids aren't. If you get one kid that doesn't say anything ever for six months and all of a sudden says, oh, my hand is a bit sore, you might act on that earlier than the kid who comes sore every session, but it's getting through all the sessions. That makes sense? Um, train load versus body. I always like to use this chart. Um, if you're putting too much load through, okay, your body, and you're not flexible enough or you've not got the right mechanics, you'll, you'll, you'll end up breaking. Okay, so the train loads come into di different things. Um, there's different aspects of train load. Can't probably see that. And, and body tolerance is all the functional testing we talked about. So last few, last five minutes, probably just giving you some um, rehab ideas, rehab tips on exercises um, and strengthening ideas. Again, can flick these through to you in a PDF. Um, Pilates is always one that people ask us about. Pilates is a really important, um, um, I suppose, thing in our perspective, but it's getting the Pilates right, okay? <laughs> Found that one somewhere, it's a good Pilates video. But um, Pilates, what is Pilates? It's so, many, it's so many different spectrums. It's like, you know, it's like physio, it's like a coaches, okay? Um, everyone comes from a different perspective, okay? And Pilates is a good thing, but sometimes Pilates is not doing what you think it's doing, and you need to know what it is that that they're going to. To go to say, oh, I've been to Pilates and they're doing floor exercise, not functional strengthening exercise, for me, isn't Pilates. Okay? So it's, it's more a semantics thing. It's a great thing to encourage any exercise, but get it right, get it specific to your athletes. And this is our marketing sort of side of things here. <laughs> Lauren and other physios do it everywhere. So find yourself a good practitioner that's near you, you can get a good relationship with. We, we've got running class, that's Lauren Shelley there, our, one of our sports physios at, um, at Claremont um, Body Logic. She runs these running classes, she runs these self-massage classes, and she's, um, I suppose, from experience and from her training as a physio, knows what exercise to put in to the program and runs it in a nice sort of clean circuit quite regularly, um, and, and you get a lot of marathon runners going, because that's what she is. But same thing is happening for the kids around places. We've got a couple in place. But again, you put your own in place. Okay, you put your own coach. You have a circuit maybe once a fortnight, once a month, where you show them exercises that are important and it's on the onus for them to go and do it. It's easy to say, not so much easy to do. So Lynn, one of your um, <laughs> athletes here, <laughs> identified with the exercises here. Um, so this is one of the athletes, one of my other physios has worked with a lot of. Um, and she's just showing us, kindly showing us some exercises that are important for running. So hip flexor endurance, looking at your ability to get strong through here. We quite often forget about that one, and actually the hip drive and the, st and the strength of hip flexor, using some cables, just using some positioning. You know, you do them in running drills, but maybe sort of before that, the stepping stones of getting body posture and then moving, okay, or coming against resistance. Um, hamstring bridge, okay, using your muscles and your hamstring and your glute, okay, to work and come up. Um, single leg squat RDL, so an exercise to actually, if everyone jumps up for a second, let's feel the hamstring work before we leave. Okay, so we're sort of fairly straight leg, body straight, coming forward, arabesque or Ar Romanian deadlift, you can call it. Arabesque is a good way to get your body from your hip, moving from your hip. And back and forth from your hands out, hands here, hold dumbbells. But if you can't move it and you're flexing, and if you're doing this, flexing your lumbar spine, you're not switching your hammy on. We need to get the hamstring working so you actually come through your hip. And can you feel that in your hammy? So building up hamstring endurance. It's an exercise that can be used, there's many of these. Um, calf endurance we talked about being very important. So. Simple exercise can do anywhere. It's just about when you put it in. You don't want to make your guys sore and then go and run from doing the exercises the first time. So put it in at the end of a session, end of a lighter session. Put it at the end of the session. They've got a day off the next day. They don't get sore. They get a bit sore, but then they can recover for the next training session. So it's important that you structure things really well when you're putting things into place. Um, some great exercise up against the wall, okay, to get your glute working in a single leg loading position. Um, Hip drive, so, so working on pushing up through your pelvis. Okay, so you, when you're running, you don't have a 
a dropping pelvis. If you run, you see the guys who drop, drop like that, do some drills where you're actually you know, holding up, holding your pelvis position up and, and knee up and down like that. Reformers using Pilates, reformers using resistance work to get that hip drive, pushing off strong glutes, strong hammies, practicing your landing by doing that, then progress them to, to hopping sort of techniques. Balance work is still important for proprioception. I suppose there's some key exercises, there's many, many more we can go through, it's just identifying it today so you know it's out there. I suppose the self-massage stuff is really good. The trigger point balls, I reckon, and an ITB roller would be a great thing for every athlete to have as a self-management thing. Save some money going to the physio for massage by doing it themselves. Okay, these balls can be really useful. Again, Lauren runs these sessions. <laughs> she, uh, and again, she, it's great because it's not so much trying to um, get people on the door, it's more trying to empower them to do their own thing. Okay, and that's probably what we're about, is it's actually making it more efficient for you to loosen yourself up. Um, so probably um, get the athletes to listen to their body, eat and sleep well, simple, simple things. Okay, we haven't presented that, but little niggles, you need to identify them. You need to actually get the kids somehow to tell you, I'm a bit sore. Get to a physio or a doctor early in the piece if you can, I think that's good. It's in identifying a group that you can sort of chat with and ring up, email. Um, loop recovery sessions are important. We haven't really done much of that, but recoveries at the beach or understanding how the athlete can recover. Um, cool down well, but get their routines happening, get them into good habits, get them into a training diary, get into a stretching routine once a week. So more, more than happy to, um, to grab an email um, from you guys if you'd like any further info or if you'd like the program sent to you. Um, uh, so, you know, as, uh, you need to draw on the people you, you sort of um, are familiar with um, and ask them for help. Um, and, you know, we also need to draw on coaches to say, oh, okay, I'm not sure how I would get this better. And maybe you might have some drills that we, we would think you know, we, we, should be, we, we should be giving you, but other way goes as well. well why don't, you know, for the coach to tell the, the physio, well, why don't you do this? So I think working together as a team with a coach and a medical is a really a positive thing. And at times the financial side of things is an issue. There's no doubt it is an issue for younger athletes. But um, parents would generally do anything for their kids and it's finding someone that would just try and identify these things, help you identify and then put you in charge of maybe managing it, which gets tough when you've got that many kids. So it just depends on how far you want to take it from a coaching point of view. So um, I didn't give you much chance for questions there, so is there any questions? <laughs> Probably hundreds of questions, but that's why I put my email up there because I knew it would be getting a lot done. So any questions, again, flick an email or Yes. Yep. How do you actually treat that? I just told them to ice it. I don't really know. Yeah, so again, if they're not, if you're not, Achilles, ice it after activity, but it's again a whole combination of these biomechanical issues. And that's what I'm trying to say to you here is that the calf endurance might be down. To treat it initially, they need some rest and some advice on what are the factors that go into that. And so, again, you, you probably advance your learning now by, by learning what you're learning, but then sort of send them to someone who then can help you teach them and teach yourself about that. So send them to a physio, you know, a local physio, or, or come and say, we have a huge amount of physios at our clinic. So uh, that's sort of a, um, a spectrum we see a lot of, but get someone local who you're familiar with, you're comfortable with, and get them to report back to you. You know, so, so that's probably the way to go. But Achilles ice, and you know, ice initially, taping the arches up, modify their training load, get their calf endurance up, look at all the other factors that might have led to that. Look at the training load as to why they got the Achilles in the first place. All those things I've sort of presented today is, is how they got it. Once it's there, it probably needs to be managed, but then understand how it got there. So it doesn't happen again. That's probably the big one. Well, if it's in your, but if it's not on your, if it's not on your heel bone, you can still have the tendon. See, I find that a lot of young girls coming off you know, running, yep. they're limping to that. One of the first questions I'm asking, because a lot of them around that area, are they playing netball as well? Because there's a lot of them, their body's changing exactly. netball. Yep, and that's where this training diary, that's where this training diary for you guys is imperative. 
I need to know what you're doing because if I'm going to train you four times a week and you're all of a sudden playing netball and you're playing with your, your sister doing, you know, basketball at the front, <laughs> you ride your bike as well, you, you want to make it too sterile so they have to change, you know, change their life. But at least you know you know you reduce training or you're only training twice a week if they're doing everything else. Because training load is a big key, remember, in regards to causing injury. And sometimes it might not be you, it might be what they're doing outside of what you are do, offering. So that's probably what that would be. I'll check the training line. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and unless you... And sometimes, even when I have a half an hour session with them, I don't get the time to ask all of that. And it'll come out, I'll say, is there anything else you've done? And it'll come out later that, oh yeah, I did, you know, I went and did 10Ks, or I, I did this, you know, one of the, one of the footy guys I went on the weekend, he's a bit sore, and I said, I said, what have you done? Oh, nothing. I went surfing down and yelling up on the weekend. So there's a, there's a six hour drive back and forth, there's surfing all day. You know, there's something that might change your, your, your possible pain. Um, so yeah, it's identifying that and then educating them on, you know what, this can actually have an effect on your body and put you at risk. And so it's, it's a balancing act. Yeah, feel free, I know everyone's got to get going. I've got a patient to get to as well. Um, so um, feel free to email or phone there and um, good luck identifying all these because all your kids will have these weird movements. It's then maybe following up Happy to do something down the track on strength, on just a, a, a strength program with these guys, or with you guys. It's an area I enjoy teaching in is um, is movement control stuff. So happy to um, to take something further, maybe next time. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. No worries, um, Jane.